Good morning. Good morning. I'm Marilyn Buck, Interim Provost and Interim Executive Vice President for Academic Affairs. And it is my pleasure to both welcome our new folks to campus and to welcome the rest of you back to campus. I have attended quite a few of these meetings in one capacity or another, and I always marvel at all of us coming together. It's a wonderful sight. The energy in this room is palpable, and I'm sure it reflects your excitement at beginning a new academic year. Please join me in welcoming Kelsey Cosen, a Doctor of Arts student in the School of Music, as she leads us in the singing of the National Anthem. Please stand. Kelsey, thank you so much. Although I will announce him, introduce him again later this morning, please welcome our 17th president, Jeffrey Mearns. And I believe just as importantly, his family who are here with us today. His wife, Jennifer, and three of his five children, Claire, Molly, and Jeffrey. We have some very special guests joining us this morning. It is my pleasure to introduce the members of the Ball State Board of Trustees. I would ask that you stand and be recognized as I call your name. Rick Hall, Chair. Thomas Bracken, Secretary. Matt Mopper, Member. Jean Ann Harcourt, Member. Mike McDaniel, Member. Marley Jaycox, Student Member. While I won't take time to introduce them individually this morning, I also want to acknowledge and thank the other members of the President's Cabinet. Would you please stand to be recognized? I have enjoyed working with them over the last few months, and I appreciate their support. We are all excited for the work ahead of us. We have around 100 new full-time faculty who participated in an orientation this week. Would all new faculty and any professional personnel who have joined us recently please stand and be recognized. I'm very impressed with the new people who have joined us and that I have had the opportunity to meet so far. We also have several international visiting scholars who have joined us or will be joining us in the next few days. We look forward to their contributions to campus life. 
These scholars join us from France, China, Germany, Italy, and South Korea. Korea. If any of the international scholars are here this morning, would you please rise and be recognized? Last spring, many of our college, colleagues achieved a new level of success. Would the faculty who are newly tenured and promoted please rise and be recognized? <laughs> Congratulations on your achievements. Have any emeriti faculty or staff joined us this morning? If so, would you please stand and let us welcome you back to campus. We appreciate your contributions and your continued support to the university. I am pleased to introduce to you our new distinguished professors. I ask that they stand and be recognized. Dr. Philip DeSica is the Phyllis Miller Professor of Health Economics. Dr. Stephen Horvitz is the John H. Snodder Professor of Free Enterprise. Dr. Yufa Wang is the John and Janice Fisher Endowed Chair in Wellness. And Dr. Ziva Zygmunt is the Helen Gant Elmore Distinguished Professor of elementary education. Congratulations. We welcome them to our ranks of distinguished faculty and we offer our thanks to our colleagues at the foundation for their valuable assistance in helping us create these illustrious positions. We've had several folks take on new administrative roles in academic affairs this year. I hope they know how much I appreciate their hard work and their willingness to serve. I do want to introduce one of these individuals, our new Dean of the College of Sciences and Humanities. Dr. Maureen McCarthy joins us most recently from Kennesaw State University, where she served as Associate Vice Provost and Professor of Psychology. Welcome to Ball State, Maureen. I also want to take a moment to recognize and introduce some of the university governance leadership, and I ask them to stand and be recognized. Tarek Mafus is the chair of faculty council. Tiffany Peters is the chair of university council, and the chair of university senate is Cortland Koch. And the university's new faculty athletic representative, or FAR, is Dr. Lindsay Bloom, associate professor of sport and exercise psychology. All of us have representatives in the university governance system. I encourage you to seek them out in the course of the next few weeks and learn more about the system itself and what is on the council agendas. Academic affairs was busy as usual last year. We added nine new undergraduate and graduate certificates to our programs. We added seven undergraduate majors and have three graduate programs majors that are awaiting itchy approval. The new Bachelor of Architecture and the new Masters of Social Work were recently approved by ITCHE. My thanks to the departments, the Undergraduate Education Committee, the Graduate Education Committee, and Academic Systems for their work. I also want to thank the departments, colleges, advising, and our friends in HR and business affairs. We hired over 25 professional advisors last year. We know they will contribute greatly to student success and faculty sanity. We also set a record this fall for graduate student enrollment. As of last week, we were just under 3,500 graduate students. Along with a lot of new people to campus and people in new roles, this last year saw reorganization of existing units and creation of new units. We have refreshed and renovated spaces. We have new policies that benefit segments of our campus, such as the policy that permits contract faculty promotions and we instituted new policies that benefit us all with changes to family leave availability, among others. And we owe thanks to the Board of Trustees for the support of all of our endeavors. But I want to take a moment to thank all of you, regardless of your office, division, or title, for what you do. Our students do not succeed without all of us. Our faculty do not reach high levels of achievement in their fields without support. We cannot remain on the cutting edge of innovative pedagogies, technologies, and environments without of all of our hard work. 
Ball State is a place of tremendous opportunity and it is a place with tremendous, tremendous people. Thank you and well done everyone. President Mearns, will you join me for the annual presentation of University Awards? At this time, it is my privilege to present awards to those who have been designated as outstanding by their colleagues and students. All of the awards we are about to present involve detailed selection processes and long hours of reviewing nominations and supporting materials by committee members. I want to thank all of you for helping us continue this tradition and for recognizing these deserving colleagues. The first three recipients were announced late last spring. With Jen Rowland, Matt Moore, and Jeff Spanky, please come to the stage. Established more than 25 years ago by Victor Lawhead, former dean of Ball State's undergraduate programs and his wife, Doris Lawhead, a former academic advisor, the Lawhead Teaching Award in General Education recognizes contributions to teaching and service in the university core curriculum, as well as a strong commitment to creating an excellent learning environment for students. The 2016-2017 award recipient is Jen Rowland, instructor of philosophy. Jen is known for capturing students' imaginations, for being highly accessible to them, and for helping students succeed through the learning objectives of the discipline and of the core curriculum. Her course evaluations, which routinely average over 4.8, are a testament to her success in implementing those practices. A review of those evaluations shows that Jen is reaching her students in meaningful ways and that they recognize her contributions to their success. Congratulations, Jen. Ball State's Office of Educational Excellence and the Office of the Provost sponsor the Excellence in Teaching, or EXIT Award, as a means to recognize faculty dedication, talent, and innovation in the classroom. The EXIT selection process begins with students nominating their choices of excellent teachers. Finalists are then invited to submit a proposal on making an existing course more innovative with an emphasis on improved student engagement. There were two EXIT winners this year. Dr. Matt Moore, Assistant Professor of Social Work, and Dr. Jeff Spanky, Assistant Professor of English. Matt will enhance Social Work 430 macro social work practice. In part, the student experience will be augmented by creating webinars that focus on athlete health and functioning, as well as grant writing. Jeff's course, English 100, Introduction to Secondary Education, will be enhanced by incorporating improvisational theater in an effort to support pre-service teachers' self-efficacy, affect, flexibility, creativity, and professional longevity. Both will deliver a presentation in the Office of Educational Excellence Colloquia series, so please watch for coming announcements. Congratulations to Jen, Matt, and Jeff. The next awards are being announced for the first time today. You may not be aware that our colleagues at the Foundation have financially supported these awards for many years. We are grateful that they are willing to do so again this year. I ask the recipients to come to the stage when I call their names. I want to acknowledge that the nomination materials are much more detailed and richer than you will hear today. These colleagues are very deserving of these awards, and I encourage you to talk with each of them regarding their achievements. Named after Dean Emeritus of the School of Extended Education, Joseph Rawlings, and established in 2002, the Rawlings Outstanding Distance Education Teaching Award honors a full-time faculty member who has proven to be dedicated to teaching in the online environment. This year, the award is presented to Dr. Shanong Gu, Assistant Professor of Information Systems and Operations Management. Dr. Gu has developed and taught four different online courses serving more than 1,300 online students since he joined Ball State in 2013. 
19 of 31 classes have been in online or hybrid format, and those courses are known for their creativity and innovation and for their clear organization promoting student success. In addition to the development and delivery of online classes, Dr. Gu is also exploring new innovative tools and approaches to enhance the online learning experience. Because most logistics and supply chain management courses involve extensive quantitative analysis, Chan is developing a, a tablet app for teaching logistics and supply chain management courses. Congratulations. Given in recognition of demonstrated excellence in championing the cause of diversity, the Outstanding Diversity Advocate Award is presented to Dr. Jagdish Kupchandani, Associate Professor of Nutrition and Health Science. <laughs> Dr. Kapchandani is deserving of this award for his significant involvement in diversity-related teaching, research, and service at Ball State and in the field of health education. Jagdish is very aggressively championed the cause of diversity in his daily routine and work. His teaching focuses on the professional development and mentoring of students with emphasis on the value of health as a human right, social justice, the influence of culture on human behavior, and health-related practices across global populations. From his work with students in the classroom, he has recruited disadvantaged, minority, and first-generation students to engage them in community projects and practical experiences. Many of these students were supported by grants from the National Science Foundation, the National Institutes of Health, the United States Department of Health and Human Services, and state and local agencies. Congratulations. The Outstanding Creative Endeavor Award is given in recognition of contributions to the university community in the creative arts. This year, the recipient excels in media and visual arts. The Outstanding Creative Endeavor Award is presented to Chris Fluke, De <laughs> Department of Telecommunications. Since joining BSU as a telecommunications instructor in 2008, Chris has advised and produced 16 video and multimedia creative projects with his students. Furthermore, he has received well over a quarter million dollars in external funding to support these projects. Chris has taken topics near and dear to the Ball State community from the history of the Ball Brothers, to a photo survey of Indiana's small towns, to a media advocacy campaign for mass transit, to name just a few. His work has been recognized and celebrated with four regional Emmys, four accolade awards, and four gold Pixie awards. Although this audience may not be familiar with, or are familiar with the Emmy awards, we should note that the accolades and Pixie awards are international in scope and highly recognized in their field. Mr. Fluke's students have received 75 local, regional, national, and international awards on projects that he has advised. Most recently, his students' documentary Everlasting Light, the story of the Indiana Bicentennial Torch Relay, received special recognition from the Indiana Office of Tur Tourism Development and has won 12 awards. Congratulations, Chris. The Outstanding Faculty Advisor Award is given to the faculty academic advisor who best demonstrates both the information and relational aspects of quality academic advising. This year, the award is presented to Dr. Marilyn Quick, Associate Professor of Educational Leadership. From 2007 to 2011, Dr. Quick was the internship director for educational leadership and responsible for coordination and oversight of the placement and supervision of over 100 principal and superintendent interns each semester. During her time in this position, Dr. Quick improved the internship program dramatically by aligning the program with national standards, heightening expectations and rigor, implementing a diversity experience for all students, and working closely with P-12 principal and superintendent supervisors in the field. One of her former students, who is now the director of elementary education for Richmond Community Schools, disclosed in his nomination that he was, and I quote, 
a kid from a single parent home, a kid that was in the welfare system, and a kid that learned early on to trust no one, end quote. He now has his doctorate and he attributes his success in school to the investment Dr. Quick has made in him. Marilyn is engaging, enthusiastic, compassionate, fair, and tough. Moreover, she inspires our students to want to teach and to lead. Congratulations. The Outstanding Faculty Service Award is given in recognition of exceptional professional service to the department, college, university, profession, community, or a combination thereof. And this year, the award is presented to Dr. David Concepcion, Professor and Chair of Philosophy and Religious Studies. Dave's goal has been and continues to be service that enhances student learning. Dr. Concepcion's service to Ball State community is tremendous, but his impact on the philosophic community via service is staggering. He serves on three editorial boards and has been the president of the American Association of Philosophy Teachers. He is a co-designer of philosophy's national model for teacher training. In 2013, he created the first ever series of national teaching and learning workshops in philosophy so that expert teacher training is available around the country. In this capacity, he has traveled to many universities, helping faculty throughout the nation to learn how to serve their students better. He created the first ever National Teaching Prize in Philosophy by raising the funds to endow the prize. He imagined and brought stakeholders together to create the Teaching Hub, a two-day teaching conference concurrent with the National Meeting of the American Philosophical Association. In short, every significant initiative in the field of philosophy that is related to teaching in the past 10 years has been driven and realized by Dave. There is no one in philosophy who has done more than Dave to advance the quality of teaching in philosophy. Congratulations, Dave. The Outstanding Administrator Award is presented to Dr. Robert Kavan, Dean of the College of Fine Arts. <laughs> Dr. Kavan has served Ball State as the Dean of the College of Fine Arts since 2000. He is a model leader with a visionary record of outstanding service to Ball State, the college, and his profession. The College of Fine Arts has, been extraordinary, has seen extraordinary growth under Bob's leadership and now enjoys three tremendously successful units in art, music, and theater and dance. It is rare to find a university across the nation that has this type of success in multiple disciplines within the arts, particularly in the Midwest. Most importantly, the growth within all three of these units includes an exponential increase in the quantity and quality of the students being auditioned and selected for the competitive programs within the college. Scholarship support through donors and the BSU Foundation has also dramatically in increased under Dr. Kavam's leadership. As a practicing musician, Bob's artistic example to his colleagues is still seen on a regular basis. He has served as music director and orchestra conductor for Guys and Dolls, My Fair Lady, Oklahoma, and the Drowsy Chaperone. Congratulations, Bob. The Outstanding Teaching Award honors a member of the full-time faculty who models excellence in teaching via the highest standards of pedagogy, creativity, or innovation in the classroom and the curriculum. Leadership in advancing teaching and learning impact on students or colleagues and scholarship of teaching. This year's recipient excels in all of these areas and she is Dr. Laura O'Hara, Associate Professor of Communication <laughs> Studies. Since arriving at Ball State, Dr. O'Hara has demonstrated unwavering commitment to her students, an exemplary dedication to innovation in teaching and curriculum development, and has garnered excellent teaching evaluations while doing so. 
Dr. O'Hara has taught many different classes in the department of all sizes at graduate and undergraduate levels to majors and non-majors alike. She shines in both theore theoretical and applied classes. Laura's teaching evaluations are superb and her scores reflect a clear consensus that she is an effective, efficient, and engaging teacher. Furthermore, Laura has been at the forefront of BSU in developing and teaching classes that demonstrate learning in a variety of forms, whether it be a small Virginia Ball Center project or her large lecture intercultural communications class, where she has facilitated collaborative endeavors between that course and classes at international universities. Additionally, her students have conducted communication audits, conflict training seminars, and communication workshops with close to 300 different agencies in and around Muncie. Congratulations, Laura. The Outstanding Research Award is presented to Dr. Scott Trappy. Janice, John and Janice Fisher, Professor of Exercise Science and Director of Human Performance Lab and Human Bioenergetics Program. Scott is deserving of this award, award both for the body of his work and significance of his research on the field of exercise physiology. Dr. Trappi is a prolific researcher of the highest caliber. His work is recognized and respected both nationally and internationally. He has been at the forefront of human exercise physiology at the cell level to better understand skeletal muscle health with aging, space flight, and athletic performance. Under Dr. Trappi's direction, the Human Performance Laboratory has studied more individual muscle fibers from a wide range of humans with various exercise interventions than any other laboratory in the world. Recently, the HBL has selected, was selected as one of the Human Clinical Center research sites for the nationwide $170 million NIH effort to study the health benefits of exercise at the molecular level. Dr. Trappi's research is published in top tier journals and has been cited well over 5,000 times. To date, Scott's research has resulted in 118 peer reviewed publications, one textbook, seven book chapters, and 140 invited lectures all over the globe. He has received funding from the most prestigious granting agencies in the United States that include the National Institutes of Health, National Aeronautical and Space Administration, Eli Lilly and Company, the United States Olympic Committee, and under other industry sponsors totaling almost $18 million. In summary, Dr. Scott Trappi's research productivity is at a level that very few individuals attain in any university environment. Congratulations, Scott. The Outstanding Junior Faculty Award is given in recognition of demonstrated composite excellence in teaching, scholarly or, product, or creative productivity, and service by a faculty member beginning an academic career who has been at Ball State for no more than five years and no more than seven full-time years in higher education. The Outstanding Junior Faculty Award is presented to Dr. Katie Lawson, Assistant Professor of Psychological Science. Since arriving at BSU just three years ago, Dr. Lawson has taught multiple undergraduate and graduate courses related to expertise in developmental psychology. Regardless of the course, her goals are consistent in that she inspires students to develop skills that will be used in a variety of future roles. She is an excellent teacher and is deeply appreciated by her students. Dr. Lawson's area of research investigates associations among work, family, and gender across the lifespan. Dr. Lawson has been exceptionally productive and has had 10 manuscripts published or accepted for publication within these research areas. Her research on workplace interventions that affect a mother's daily work experiences, parent-child interactions, and children's emotional well-being were covered by the Cambridge and Princeton University Child and Family Blog, Reuters Health, and the Medical Press. Because of her highly regarded research, Dr. Lawson was nominated for the 2015 Rosabeth Moss Cantor Award for Excellence in Work Family Research. Congratulations, Katie.
The Outstanding Faculty Award winner is Dr. Lawrence Judge, Professor of Kinesiology. Dr. Judge began his career at Ball State in 2006, and during his tenure, he has excelled in the categories of teaching, scholarship, and professional engagement. Dr. Judge is a versatile faculty member within the school, teaching a variety of courses in multiple areas. He has also mentored numerous students outside the classroom, as evidenced by his work with over 30 graduate and undergraduate student projects and grant proposals. Dr. Judge is a prolific author, having published over 150 peer-reviewed journal articles. His work has appeared in such national publications as Journal of Strength and Conditioning, International Journal of Sports Science and Coaching, and Journal of Coaching Education. In addition to refereed articles, Dr. Judge has also published six textbooks and 28 textbook cha chapters related to various topics in athletics and coaching. Larry is a highly sought after speaker, having delivered well over 200 peer reviewed national and international presentations. Dr. Judge has also been successful with grants, having received close to half a million dollars in funding. Dr. Judge is regularly recruited as a consultant to such prestigious national organizations as USA Track and Field, the U.S. Olympic Committee, Paralympics, International Amateur Athletics Federation, and the Professional Skaters Association. If Dr. Judge's teaching, scholarship, and service profiles were not enough, his accomplishments as a coach practitioner are laudable. He has coached nine Olympians, including two United States record holders. He is recognized as a worldwide premier coach in track and field throwing events. Most recently, he served as an assistant coach for the 2016 United States Paralympic team in Rio de Janeiro and personally coached gold medalist David Blair. In every sense, Lawrence Judge has been an outstanding member of the Ball State faculty during his years at the institution. Congratulations, Larry. And please join me in congratulating all of our award winners again. Now it is my pleasure to introduce our 17th president, Jeffrey S. Mearns. <laughs> president Mearns joined us last May. I have enjoyed working with him this summer, and I appreciate his hard work in getting to know our community and laying the foundation for us to make short and long-term plans. On campus, he has met with students, faculty, and staff. He toured Muncie by bus and has met with local civic organizations. He has spent time on the road meeting with alumni, friends of the university, and government officials. He has shared our successes with media outlets here in Muncie as well as Indianapolis and Fort Wayne. At his first commencement as Ball State President, he inspired our graduates to never settle for anything less than excellence, continue to serve their neighbors, and to stay true to the values articulated in the Beneficence Pledge. President Mearns has a distinguished vita. He earned his undergraduate degree in English from Yale University and a JD from the University of Virginia. After a legal career that included serving as a federal prosecutor, he joined Cleveland State University. He first served as Dean and Professor of Law at Cleveland Marshall College of Law, then as Provost and Senior Vice President for Academic Affairs. In 2012, he became President of Northern Kentucky University, where he led the development of a new strategic plan. We are fortunate to have President Mearns with us today, and I look forward to his remarks this morning. Let's give him a warm welcome. Well, thank you, Marilyn, and good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It is a privilege, a privilege to serve as the president of Ball State University, and it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure to be with you as we prepare for another productive and promising new academic year. This morning, what I'd like to do is share with you some of the impressions that I've gained during my first three months as your new president. Simply put, in a short period of time, my appreciation, my respect, and my admiration for you and my admiration for your work, all of those have grown significantly. I am proud. I'm proud to be the president of Ball State University. I will also talk today about our future, 
a future that you know poses some challenges. In my view, though, our future presents many more opportunities. And I'm energized and I'm optimistic about our future. But before I share those observations and preview some of those opportunities, I need to express my appreciation to several groups of people. First, I want to thank the members of the Presidential Search Committee. That search committee, which was led by Trustee Matt Momfer, developed a very compelling presentation of this university. During our discussions, the members of the committee asked some good probing questions, which were appropriate. Yet they also communicated their passion, their genuine passion for our mission, and they embodied the gracious charm of this university's culture. Matt, I'm grateful to you and your colleagues on the committee for helping to give me this special opportunity. Thank you. I also want to express my appreciation to all of the members of the Board of Trustees, many of whom are with us this morning. Thank you for joining us. I know that you are individually and collectively committed to the mission of Ball State. And I have come to know very well that you have entrusted me with leading an institution that you cherish so very deeply. And I will honor that trust with my best efforts. And finally, I want to thank the members of the Presidential Transition Committee. This committee was led by Tom and Sheila Bracken. The committee has developed a comprehensive plan to guide my first few months as your new president. This extensive plan has enabled me, really, in a very short time to meet many people, both on campus and in the community and all across the state. The solid foundation has been valuable to me, and I'm grateful to you and your colleagues, Tom, for your good counsel. And then to all of you. Thank you very much for welcoming me and to welcoming my family into your community and, to in, and into our new home. So now when my appointment was announced in January, I told the people who gathered that afternoon in Sursa Hall that my first task, really my first responsibility, was to learn more about the people and the programs here at Ball State. I know from some experience that if I'm going to be able to participate in leadership with you, if I'm able to lead effectively, I need to have a greater knowledge and understanding of your perspectives, your past contributions, and your aspirations for our future, your dreams for Ball State University. So between February and May, I visited campus on several occasions to meet with members of the leadership team and other members of our university community. I read briefing memos and I reviewed several reports. Then in March, I participated in a meeting with the governor and the presidents of the other public universities in Indiana. And in April, I spent a day meeting with the members of the General Assembly. And during these meetings and these conversations, I was able to hear what our elected officials expect, expect from our universities. But I also took advantage of that opportunity. I took advantage of that oppor opportunity to tell them that here in Indiana, we are fortunate that they continue to invest in public higher education. And I urged them to sustain and increase that critical investment. And then I began my official service as your president on May 15th. That day, as you may have seen on social media, I visited a few classes, and it just happened to be National Chocolate Chip Cookie Day. <laughs> so I got to hand out chocolate chip cookies to students and faculty and staff all across campus. And that was great, great, because that's a good coincidence, because I love chocolate chip cookies. But I also visited the Human Performance Lab that afternoon. And I watched a graduate student be subjected to a grueling test administered by Scott Trappy, who just received an award this morning. And I was impressed, but I have to tell you, I was also a little intimidated. But nevertheless, I thought I would share with them some of my thoughts about exercise and nutrition. Thought that these experts could benefit from some of my insights. <laughs> so I told Scott and his colleagues, I said, you know, not only do I love chocolate chip cookies, but I love chocolate chip ice cream. And they assured me, this is what they said. They said, that, that mix, that constitutes a balanced meal. It's the <laughs> virtual diet of champions. Well, that's what they said. But I know what they were thinking. They were thinking, at your age, it doesn't even matter. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> that hurt. That hurt more than one of those muscle biopsies that you, you, know, that you heard about. And then at the end of my first day, I also got a chance to meet a couple of our campus police officers 
See, when I went out to my car that evening around 7 o'clock, I realized as I got to my car that I had locked my car keys and my office keys in a drawer in my office. That's right. On the first day, I locked myself out of my office and my car, and I got to meet some of our great campus police officers. <laughs> but I think it's on an upswing since that uh, somewhat awkward start for both of us, me and those officers. Uh, in June, I attended my first meeting of the Board of Trustees, and at that meeting, as you know, our board approved the smallest undergraduate tuition rate increase in more than 40 years. That decision reflects our collective commitment, the hard work that you have done for so many years to provide an outstanding education at an affordable price. In June, I attended my first meeting of the Ball State Alumni Association and my first meeting of the Ball State University Foundation. The members of the Alumni Association Board are passionate supporters of this university. They're enthusiastic about helping us to achieve our mission and to elevate the profile and prominence of Ball State. We're also very fortunate to have a foundation board that consists of graduates and other friends who contribute and help raise private donations to support us. These philanthropic investments are our margin of excellence. And I'm grateful for this critical support and I'm grateful to the staff of our foundation, the men and women who engage, identify, and inspire these generous benefactors. During the past few months, I've also met with our academic deans and other faculty and staff. And several weeks ago, I had the good fortune to have breakfast with Dr. Cortland, Cortland uh, Koch. Excuse me. I, I was in New York, and I keep thinking of Mayor Koch. Cortland Koch. Now, if you know Cortland as I've gotten to know him, it was a lively and entertaining discussion. <laughs> and Cortland, I promise, I'm not going to tell anyone, not going to tell anyone, especially your faculty colleagues, that you picked up the tab for that breakfast. That'll be our secret, OK? So during these first few months, I've also had the opportunity to meet people in the local community and throughout the state. As the provost said a moment ago in May, I went on a bus tour of Muncie with the members of the board of the Ball Brothers Foundation. And this tour was illuminating and encouraging to me. I'm convinced, I'm convinced that we have all the necessary resources, the financial and human capital, to spur the revival and rejuvenation of Muncie, Delaware County, and East Central Indiana. And in June, I attended a meeting, a joint meeting of the Muncie Chamber of Commerce and the Delaware Advancement Corporation. That conversation was also instructive and enlightening and inspiring. In May and June, I also attended three alumni events, one in Indianapolis, one in Fort Wayne, one in Washington, DC. Just last Friday evening, there was a small alumni gathering in Lake Tippecanoe. And just this past Wednesday evening, we hosted a large event for our graduates who live here in the Muncie area. You know, we have more than 190,000 living alumni, and I've already had the great good fortune of meeting hundreds of them. They are proud, they are loyal, they are grateful, and they are yearning to become more deeply engaged in the future of Ball State. And then finally, four weeks ago, I attended my first commencement as your president. Three times each year, as you know, we gather to celebrate the success of our students and to recognize the collective contributions of our faculty and staff, significant contributions, as the provost said, that made those individual achievements of our students possible. It was a great day. I love commencement, and I look forward to many more as the president of Ball State University. So what have I learned? What have I learned during these first three months? Our university's financial condition is very sound. For many years, we have managed our resources prudently and strategically. As I mentioned a moment ago, this practice, this history, has enabled our board to approve the smallest undergraduate tuition increase in more than 40 years. But we've also benefited from the state's sustained investment in public higher education, as I also mentioned. That investment has not been increasing as rapidly today as it did in the past decades. But we are fortunate. We're fortunate because Indiana is one of an, only a small handful of states in the country that is now investing more money in public higher education today than prior to the Great Recession. So we will continue to ask the governor and the General Assembly for additional increases in our operating appropriation. Our students, our faculty, and our staff deserve that support. But we should and we will begin that appeal with an expression of gratitude. 
We're also benefiting from the state's significant investments in our facilities. Two years ago, we received $62.5 million to design and build a new health professions building. And as you can see right across the street, that construction project is now underway. This past spring, the General Assembly appropriated an additional $87.5 million to allow us to design and build a new foundational science building, also on the new East Quad. And we expect that as we are opening the new Health Professions Building in 2019, we will then begin construction on the new Science Building, which will be completed in 2021. These state-funded projects will continue the physical transformation of our campus. And because of the state's investment, we'll be able to use our own resources to build the first two phases of the East Mall Greenway. This pedestrian and bicycle-friendly path will eventually run all the way from Ashland Avenue to Neely Avenue. Our careful, prudent fiscal planning has also enabled us to build and maintain our residence halls. I toured a couple of the halls uh, last week, and they're outstanding. You know, I've moved my children into many dorm rooms on several college campuses, and I can assure you that none of those rooms, none of those residence halls were even close to the quality and, and capacity of our dorms. And I've been asked, you know, a few times over the last few weeks, what surprised me the most since I arrived at Ball State? And I need to tell you that near the top of that list is the campus. And that's because before I was selected by the board, I had only visited the campus once in January, and that was just a few weeks before my appointment was announced. Perhaps you may have noticed that the campus looks an awful lot better on a summer afternoon in May than it looks on a cold, dark January night. And no matter, and one of the things, I, the reason I bring that up is because no matter the weather, no matter the season, the men and women who maintain our campus provide us with a clean, beautiful place to work, to teach, and to study, and I think we should express our appreciation to them for their service. So now our Tuition, our beautiful modern facilities, they attract outstanding students, and our enrollment has grown the last few years. In the fall of 2012, I'm going to give you just a couple of statistics. In the fall of 2012, we enrolled approximately 3,600 new freshmen. Last fall, we enrolled more than 3,900. That was the second largest freshman class in 15 years and the third largest in our history. Well, here's the good news. We are pre presently projecting this year's freshman class to be even larger. In fact, we are projecting that more than 4,000 new freshmen will begin classes on Monday. Kay Bales told me just this morning that the current number of new freshmen that are enrolled at Ball State is 4,013, approximately. Now we have to wait, we have to wait about 10 days till a week from Monday to confirm the final census, but this fall, we may very well enroll the largest freshman class in our history, and these new students will be as well qualified and more diverse than last year's class. And more good news, our total enrollment, undergraduate, returning, and graduate, is presently projected to exceed 22,000 students, and it's very likely that we will enroll more students this year than in any year in our history, and that is something to celebrate. Now, these achievements, as I say, they're due in part to our affordable tuition and our excellent facilities. And our success, though, really is the product of several notable programs that identify students who may not realize that a college education is within their grasp. For example, this past year, we resurrected our Dream Makers Luncheon in partnership with the Center for Leadership Development. This program is designed to recruit first-generation students of color in Indianapolis. And one of these students is the daughter of a single parent who worked three jobs to support her family. They couldn't afford a television, so this young woman spent her free, free time dreaming, and she spent her free time drawing buildings that she hoped someday she would design. And she got really good at drawing buildings. So good, in fact, that one of her high school teachers saw some of her drawings and encouraged her to apply to our College of Architecture and Planning. This young woman applied to CAP, she was accepted, and she has received a CAP scholarship. 
Yesterday, she moved into her residence hall on our campus, and she starts classes on Monday. She dreams of being an architect someday. And I think, I know, that we are about to make that young woman's dreams come true. But the, but the most significant reason that more and more excellent, ambitious students choose Ball State is because of our outstanding academic programs. We have an excellent reputation for academic quality, and that reputation continues to improve. That reputation is driven by the work of our faculty, and we celebrated some of those achievements earlier this morning. There are many others, but let me share a few of them with you today. This fall, Professor Mark Buscelli will be inducted into the Indianapolis Jazz Hall of Fame. In addition to his own performances and recordings, which have gained national and international acclaim, several of his students have won international awards. And this past summer, Professor Buscelli took 25 outstanding students to perform at the Montreux Jazz Festival in Switzerland. Speaking of the arts, our Department of Theater and Dance now has more than 450 students majoring in one of its programs. And each year, more than 1,500 prospective students from across the country audition for, only, for one of only 40 slots. 1,500 prospective students audition for only 40 slots in our acting and musical theater BFA programs. Much closer to home, Professor Michael Doyle in our College of Sciences and Humanities continues to engage and inspire our students in an immersing learning project that will help us to celebrate our centennial. Professor Doyle is presently working on the second phase of an oral history project that chronicles the lives of African Americans who graduated from Ball State in the 1950s. The faculty and teachers college are also preparing for our second century. For example, Professor James Flowers was recently recognized as the Technology and Engineering Teacher Educator of the Year by an international teachers organization. In our College of Communication, Information, and Media, as you know, our SportsLink program continues to receive national recognition. Professor Chris Taylor, the Executive Director of SportsLink, recently received the College Sports Pioneer Award, which honors innovators in video production and technology at the college level. And to date, SportsLink has received 16 student and professional Emmy Awards. There is no other program in the country that even comes close. And in CAP, Emeritus Professor Tony Costello and five of his students were recently recognized by Architect Magazine for their innovative design work. They designed, and this is a quote, sunlight, a sunlight-powered kiln and a new concrete block shape that could be a solution for more, more resilient construction in Haiti. And graduates from CAP's construction management program have now had a 100% placement rate for three consecutive years. There are also outstanding programs, as you know, in the Miller College of Business. For example, our online MBA program is ranked 12th in the country by U.S. News and World Report. And graduates from the Logistics and Supply Chain Management program also have a 100% placement rate. And that's because of the partnerships with industry and the exposure and experience our students receive as a result of the required internship in that program. Now, the successful placement rates in CAP and the Miller College of Business, those successful placement rates all across our campus are also the product of the support our students receive from the dedicated staff in our Career Services Center. And in June, just a few weeks ago, our staff received the Career Service Excellence Award for large colleges from the National Association of College and Employers. We were the only recipient in the country of this prestigious award. And you heard about the Human Performance Lab in the College of Health. You heard about their being selected to participate in a $170 million study commissioned by the NIH. The other universities that were chosen to participate in this extraordinary study include Harvard, Stanford, and Duke. All of these factors, these activities, these achievements, all of these have contributed to the successful outcomes that you have produced for so many years. Since 1997, that critical freshman to sophomore retention rate here has increased approximately 13 percentage points. During that same 20-year time period, to put that achievement in context, during that same 20-year time period, the collective national retention rate for all colleges and universities combined has only increased by two or three percentage points. 
So that shows you that our improvement has been dramatic. In only five years, we've also increased our on-time four-year graduation rate by 15 percentage point, our points. Our rate now exceeds the Indiana state average by almost eight percentage points. And during this time, we've made great progress in closing the achievement gap of underrepresented minority students. Between 2011 and 2016, the on-time graduation rate for our minority and stu students has increased by nearly 16 percentage points. That's almost twice the statewide average. Our student athletes excel in the classroom. Last spring, the collective GPA for all sports programs was 3.2, and our outstanding women's swimming team earned the highest GPA, 3.65. But this past year was significant for our student athletes. Three of our graduating seniors received prestigious postgraduate fellowships from the NCA. To put this in context, across the entire MAC conference, the NCA only awarded four of these postgraduate fellowships. Three, we earned three of those four. That is a significant achievement. More students, better completion rates, and better outcomes necessarily, as the provost said, mean more graduates, and the numbers are quite impressive. She shared with you the number from last year, but here's some context. In 2010, we awarded approximately 4,800 degrees. This past year, our students earned approximately 5,800 degrees. That's an increase of more than 20% in just seven years. These impressive outcomes, as she said, are a testament to the commitment of our outstanding faculty and our dedicated staff. And I want to thank all of you as I begin my service. Thank you all for your contributions to the success of our students. And I've also come to learn that the success is also the product of our distinctive approach to education. At Ball State, we continue to value the partnership, the personal educational relationship between an experienced educator and a bright, ambitious student. And I want to share with you a story, a story that I believe exemplifies this distinctive commitment and that demonstrates the impact that you have every day on our students. The story is about Arlesha Moore. She was a first-generation college student when she arrived on our campus a few years ago. She arrived with a dream, but with very little money. In fact, during her freshman year, Arlesha's family lost their home. But Arlesha persisted. And just in May, she graduated with a bachelor's degree in criminal justice and criminology, and she graduated with honors. She is now pursuing a master's degree at a university in England as the recipient of a Fulbright scholarship. And when she completes her studies, she plans to return home to get a law degree so that she can become a civil rights attorney. And Arlesha credits the Honors College for changing her life. And she specifically identifies Dr. Michael Brown as her mentor, as the person who believed in her when she had her doubts. Professor Brown described Arlesha as a quiet, confident student, but he said that hidden behind those attributes is a passionate desire to make a difference in our society. And when Professor Brown heard that Arlesha had received a Fulbright scholarship, he said it was very emotional for him. And here's why. These are his words. She's done everything that we tell our students to do, to work hard, to defer gratification, to dream big, to believe in yourself. If you do those things, good things will come. And Professor Brown is right. And each day, you share that motivational message with all of our students, and I thank you. And Professor Brown's wise words, I believe, apply equally to our mission. We must work hard. We must dream bold dreams. We must pursue those dreams with optimism. And if we do these things, good things will come. Good things will come for our university and for our students. Now, I suspect that uh, you were already familiar with many of the facts and figures that I cited this morning. And some of you may have read about Arlesha on our website. So you're probably asking yourself, why did I share, why did I share this information with you? Well, there are several reasons. First, I did it to reinforce an important point. Our university is strong, and we are well positioned for the future. Now, I know, I know that you have gone through a protracted transition in leadership. I can appreciate that this transition has caused some uncertainty and perhaps some anxiety as well. 
it certainly has diverted some attention from the fundamental strength, from the good work of this university. This protracted transition may have been a distraction, but it has not undermined the strength of this institution, and it has not impeded our progress. Simply put, Ball State is strong, and our university is getting stronger day by day, year by year. That's just a fact. I've also provided this information so that you can share it with others, with your colleagues, with our alumni and our friends, and also with prospective students. During this protracted transition, we've not been as active in communicating this good news. Over the last few years, that's after a decade of some effective marketing, we've retreated a bit from the public view. Some people now have told me that we have once again become a hidden gem. Well, that's about to change. Because over the next few months, we are going to reveal a refreshed brand, and we are going to launch a new marketing campaign. We are going to be more vocal. We are going to be more visible. We are going to tell the Ball State story with the passion and with the energy that it deserves. And fortunately, the research associated with this campaign has demonstrated that people all across the state They've already come to appreciate the excellent quality of our programs and our people. So now we are going to demonstrate that we are not just a viable option for students who want a good education at a reasonable, affordable price. Instead, we are going to prove that Ball State should be, that Ball State must be a student's first choice, the best option for students who want an excellent education at a university that will prepare them to have a successful career and to lead a meaningful life. That will be our objective. And it's the perfect time, in my view, to launch this bold campaign because next year we will also begin to celebrate our centennial. For several months, as some of you know, a large and diverse group of faculty and staff and alumni have de been developing a plan to commemorate this historic anniversary. And I've had a chance to review the draft plan, and I can assure you that it's creative and comprehensive. We'll have many opportunities to celebrate our achievements. And I shared some of the information about the current strength of our university because I want you to be prepared to celebrate this centennial with excitement and with enthusiasm. And I also hope that you will embrace these activities with an abiding sense of gratitude. Gratitude for the women and the men who founded this institution and for those people who transformed it into the outstanding university that all of us have now inherited. This year, as we finalize the details of this year-long celebration, we will also develop a new strategic plan for our university's second century. And that's really the final reason that I shared this information with you this morning. And really, throughout the search process and during the past few months, many people have told me that it's imperative that I help to articulate a vision for our future and that I should do so very soon. It's, that sentiment is understandable given the protracted transition. It's also expected, given the various external forces that are threatening to disrupt the traditional model of higher education. But I ask you, I've got a couple requests today. I ask that you pause for a few months to enable me to continue my orientation at Ball State. And I want to explain that. A few years ago, I read an extensive report on the future of higher education that was written by a faculty committee at another university. The president of the university gave this committee two important tasks. First, to identify the major challenges that confronted higher education in America. And then second, to develop specific recommendations to meet those challenges. And so after extensive research and analysis and debate, the faculty committee concluded that there were three major factors that threatened to disrupt the status quo. The first factor the committee identified was, and this is a quote, was the staggering expansion of knowledge produced largely by specialization. In effect, what they said was, the liberal arts were no longer valued because graduates needed to be prepared for a specific job. The second factor identified by the committee was the increasing number and kinds of institutions. The committee recognized that this growth was, nece growth was necessary in order to make higher education more accessible to people who had not previously been given the opportunity to go to college. But this growth, growth, they concluded, also threatened enrollment at their institution, and it might even diminish their university's prestige. The third factor was the ever-growing complexity of society. According to the faculty authors, 
This complexity was the product of technological advances and the increasing internationalization of business and culture. The committee also recognized that colleges and universities were increasingly responsible for two overarching objectives that may be in tension with one another. Increasingly, we are responsible for preparing our students for a specific career. But we are also expected to educate our students to be informed, well-rounded citizens in our democratic society. And of course, these factors and these challenges sound very familiar to all of us. But this report wasn't prepared by the faculty of a public university in the Midwest. It was written by the faculty at Harvard University. And although I read the report five years ago, it wasn't drafted even in the last decade. It was published as a book in 1945, more than 70 years ago. You know, sometimes we have a tendency to think that we are the first ones to encounter serious challenges. This study shows, this is why I shared it, this study shows that we're not the first generation of educators to be confronted with these important questions. Now, we all have to realize that the pace of change has accelerated in recent years, and the adverse consequences of inaction are much more consequential for us than they were for Harvard 70 years ago. But this report proves this key point, that these significant challenges can be overcome with careful planning, with bold, innovative solutions, and with disciplined, determined, and persistent execution. At our university, the strong position that I described this morning, it gives us the opportunity to develop our next strategic plan thoughtfully and deliberately. Some institutions out there, they need to respond to existential threats with desperate urgency. These vulnerable institutions must move quickly to shore up declining enrollments or to balance their budgets because of continued reductions in state support. In contrast, we're fortunate. We can plan with deliberate urgency. But this opportunity, this opportunity, this opportunity to take some additional time imposes upon us a reciprocal obligation, an obligation to develop an ambitious, innovative vision for, for what our university should become, not just in the next few years, but in the next two decades. That, in my opinion, that should be our time horizon. And so here's the timeline for the strategic planning process that I shared with the board. This fall, rather than immediately initiating the process for developing that plan, I will continue to learn more about our programs and more about our people, about you. And I'm looking forward to visiting with the faculty and staff in each college, and I'll continue to meet with the staff in other divisions across campus. And at the suggestion of the Transition Committee, I will also participate this fall in several walking tours of the campus. These tours will help me orient me to the buildings and facilities on our campus, and it will enable me to visit with the faculty and staff, with all of you where you work. All of these activities will provide me with the background and the context to develop our strategic planning process. And so by the end of the fall semester, I'll appoint a strategic planning committee consisting of a relatively small but representative group of faculty and staff, as well as a student and perhaps a graduate of Ball State. If you're interested in serving on this committee or if you know of someone who would make a constructive contribution, I encourage you, please, please let me know. Then beginning in January of 2018, just this January, this committee will assess our strengths and our challenges in a thorough and systematic way. Throughout the spring semester, the committee will also solicit input from the university community in various ways, including through surveys and open forums. Next summer, the committee will synthesize this information into a draft document that includes proposed mission and vision statements, a set of proposed core values, a concise list of overarching objectives, and a relatively small number of key strategies. Our plan must be truly strategic, not an exhaustive list of discrete tactics. Next fall, this draft will be circulated on campus in order to receive further input and suggested revisions. And after considering and incorporating where appropriate, the committee will present a proposed final draft to the board for its consideration and approval no later than December 2018. I intend to chair this committee, and I hope that all of you, that all of you will participate in the process. 
As you may have seen in an email that I distributed on Tuesday, I've restructured a presently vacant position in my office in order to create a new member of the university's leadership team, a chief strategy officer. I anticipate that this person will play an important role in helping us to formulate that new strategic plan. I also anticipate that he or she will help to ensure that this plan is implemented effectively across the entire university. Now, of course, before we begin the strategic planning process and while it proceeds, we're, we won't be treading water. To the contrary, I'm confident that all of you will continue to do the good work that has enabled our university to thrive during this protracted transition. And we'll also continue to work on the initiatives that I mentioned a few moments ago, including the new branding and marketing campaign and the centennial celebration. Our outstanding facility staff will develop the designs for new residence halls on the north end of campus and the new science building in the East Quad. And next spring, we will complete a strategic enrollment plan that will enable us to continue to attract and enroll a well-qualified and increasingly diverse new class of students. So given this context, it would perhaps be premature and presumptuous for me to predict precisely what will be included in our strategic plan, but I want to take just a few moments to share some preliminary thoughts. We should accelerate our transition from delivering content in the classroom. As you well know, because of technology, our students can obtain information much more efficiently in other ways than a traditional lecture. So we should continue to use our classrooms to foster discussions about that information, to help our students better appreciate the critical difference between information on one hand and knowledge and judgment on the other. I know that this transition is already well underway here. We should expand our efforts to impart valuable skills, skills that apply to a student's chosen discipline, as well, as well as more universal skills that all graduates need in order to succeed in an economy and in a society that is rapidly changing due to technological advances. We should increase the number and variety of opportunities for our students to apply the knowledge and judgment that they have gained and the skills that they have acquired to real world challenges and problems. With, with immersive learning, I've come to know, as well as with the internships, the many internships and practicums, we have already demonstrated our commitment to such valuable experiential learning opportunities. We should also ensure that our students have many opportunities to meet and interact with people from different cultures who, or who have different perspectives and opinions. With freshmen and sophomores, as you know, we, we do an excellent job of using living learning communities to engage, our to engage our students with our universities by assigning them to residence halls with other students who have similar interests. Perhaps we should encourage or require juniors and seniors to, to participate in structured seminars with students from different majors, with students who have different backgrounds and aspirations. These experiences may ensure that after they graduate, our students will embrace the importance of intellectual curiosity, lifelong learning, the passion for lifelong learning that will enable them to thrive in an increasingly dynamic and interconnected world. I believe that the entire learning experience should be more intentional. Presently, we, we require our students to complete a design curriculum in order to receive a degree, and we offer a variety of other co-curricular and extracurricular programs. Perhaps we should require all students to complete a more structured program that requires skills-based and experiential learning opportunities. And perhaps all of our programs should be more strategically structured to lead students progressively through each phase while still allowing some flexibility to respond to individual aptitude and ambition. These are just some preliminary thoughts. Of course, you may very well have a different view of our future and what the plan should contain. And that's the benefit. That's the benefit of having a deliberate consultative planning process, one where all voices will be heard and where all opinions will be considered. And so I look forward to receiving your input and your guidance. But there is one aspect of the plan, of the next plan, that I feel very strongly about. I have a firm conviction that our next plan must be grounded in certain core values, the enduring core values that are articulated in the Beneficence Pledge. We must maintain our commitment to excellence, excellence in teaching, scholarship, and service. We must maintain our commitment to honesty, integrity, and integrity, because character matters. We must treat every person with dignity and respect, irrespective of their race, their ethnicity, 
their sexual orientation or their sexual identity. We must listen actively and empathetically to people who have different opinions and different ideas. And I want to take just a moment to say a few words about those last two values. Last weekend, we all watched the extraordinary and the extraordinarily unfortunate events in Charlottesville, Virginia. And for me, it was personal. I was born in Charlottesville. At the time, my father was on the law faculty at the University of Virginia. As a child, I ran around on the university lawn not far from where on Friday evening, white supremacists carried torches. I was baptized in a church within a few blocks from the site where Heather Heyer was murdered on Saturday. My daughter, Claire, who is here today, was baptized in that same church. As you heard, I learned, earned my law degree from UVA. Members of my extended family have more than 10 undergraduate or advanced degrees from the University of Virginia. My son, Jeffrey, who is also here today, is about to begin his sophomore year there. His cousin, my niece, Olivia, will be a senior at the University of Virginia this fall. My sister, Tracy, is Olivia's mother. Olivia's father, my sister's husband, my brother-in-law, is African-American. What happened in Charlottesville last weekend, as I said, was personal. It was profoundly disturbing. It was sad. So what are we to do? What are we to do? First, all of us must condemn, condemn unequivocally, the racial hatred, the bald-faced bigotry that instigated the violent confrontation that led to the deaths of these three people. But here's the point. Here's the point. Thank you. Hold on. That's Hold on. That's the first step. But all of us must also continue to do the work to create a more inclusive culture right here on our campus. That work That work is hard. It, require us, it requires us to engage in courageous conversations. It requires all of us to reflect candidly on our preconceptions and our predispositions. We must engage others deeply. We must engage others with an open mind and with an open heart. And progress, real progress, requires a sustained effort from all of us. But if each one of us, in our homes, in our neighborhoods, in our universities, in our corporations or other organizations, if we are all able to create inclusive cultures with the people that we meet each day, then I believe we can continue to create a more just society. We can form, we can form the more perfect union that our founding fathers envisioned. This is my hope and that should be our goal. So uh, now I'm going to, on a related note, you know, we often talk at universities about shared governments, governance. I suggest a different articulation of, a, of the same principle. I suggest that we should embrace a commitment to shared responsibility. Because if we are going to instill these enduring values in our students and in our children, we must model this behavior ourselves every day, in every interaction and in every activity. We should not be preoccupied with who governs this institution. We should recognize that irrespective of our title, each one of us should strive to lead in our own way. Each one of us has the capacity. Each one of us has the responsibility to be a servant leader. Each one of us has the shared responsibility to put the best interests of our university before our own personal self-interest. 
These characters, these enduring values have guided the faculty and staff and students of this institution for nearly 100 years. These values have brought us to this place at this time. And I believe that these values, these commitments, will ensure that we deliver a bright, bold future for the women and the men who will succeed us in the years to come. And so, as we prepare to develop the plan for our future, I just want to pause for a few minutes to reflect on the transformative impact that a Ball State education has had on two recent graduates. Their experiences and their ambitions exemplify the transformative changes that we have on our students and the impact that our graduates then have on our communities and our world. Sarah McInerney graduated from Ball State in 2014. <laughs> she earned a degree in communication studies. She grew up in Griffith, Indiana. She was an excellent athlete. She played soccer here for a short time, and she was an excellent student. But like me in my last semester in college, she wondered what she would do for her first job. But for her, she could accept a full-time job with a company based in Indianapolis, or she could serve as an intern with the Finish Line Youth Foundation. This foundation is the philanthropic arm of a national retailer of athletic shoes, apparel, and accessories. Sarah chose the internship. She chose the internship based on the advice of her mentor, her mentor Professor Laura O'Hara, who received an award today. She was the one who ran down. <laughs> And this is what Sarah said to Professor O'Hara. This is a quote. In the end, my decision came down to choosing what I'm passionate about. Pretty good advice from a very young woman. During that summer, though, Sarah knew that her position was only temporary. But she thought that if she worked hard and built a network of relationships with other foundation employees, then they would help her find another job. And then someday, someday, in her words, another door would open that would lead me back to the foundation. But the foundation president had another plan. He and his colleagues were so impressed by Sarah's passion and commitment that the foundation simply created a position for her. In Sarah's words, I nailed the job of my dreams right out of college. And now Sarah coordinates philanthropic events for Finish Line throughout the Northeast, and she coordinates the foundation's involvement with the Special Olympics. When she speaks to high school students or college students, she sums up her advice in one simple sentence. This is Sarah. Always follow your passion over a paycheck. That's pretty good advice. And here's Sarah's personal motto. What more can I do? What more can I do? And I suggest that as we prepare to develop and then implement our next strategic plan, perhaps we should ask ourselves that same question. What more can I do? What more can I do? And now let me tell you about Yosef Teklewold. Yosef was born and initially raised in a small village in Ethiopia. And like me, Yosef was the fifth of nine children. I was fortunate. My parents had the capacity to provide exceptional educational opportunities to me and to all of my siblings. Yosef was also fortunate, but he was fortunate in a different way. Because of financial constraints and cultural norms, most parents in Ethiopia are not able to educate all of their children. Only the oldest children are given these opportunities. But rather than confining Yosef to working on the family farm, his parents allowed him to be adopted by Marta Gebre Sadik, Ethiopia's first female senator, and her husband, Demeke Teklewold. This couple founded Project Mercy, a nonprofit Christian organization that is based in Fort Wayne. The organization provides educational and economic development opportunities in rural Ethiopia. And Yosef has a straightforward explanation for why his Muslim parents decided to allow him to be adopted by a Christian couple. And these are his words. The only explanation, I think it's just from God. Yosef graduated in July with a master's degree from our Center for Information and Communication Studies, and I had the honor of handing him a Ball State diploma. And he'll now return to his village in Ethiopia. He aspires to use the education he received here to help his friends 
in his home country. And here's how he describes his life's goal. My legacy will be if I have the opportunity to help people, to empower others. That will be success. And I think that his words also sum up our individual and collective aspirations. Ours is a worthy goal. It is an admirable mission to educate and to thereby empower others. When Yosef Teklawold arrived on our campus, some students had difficulty pronouncing his last name, so he gave them a tip. He said it sounds like take the world. Yes, it does. And I believe because of the work that you do, he will. He will. And in just a few months, we will embark upon a process to articulate a bold vision for our second century, for our future, for our legacy. And I suggest that we follow his lead. Let's take the world. Let's take the world. And so as we begin another academic year, it's a year, as I said, that's filled with great promise and opportunity. I hope that you share my enthusiasm, my optimism, and my ambition for our university. As you return to work today, as you return to your offices or as you go off to your college meetings, I have some suggestions. Actually, I have a few requests. As you go about this busy day, and I know it's a busy day, please pause. Pause to reflect on your individual contributions to our collective success. I hope that these reflections fill you with a sense of satisfaction, with a sense of genuine pride. Also, please pause to reflect on our good fortune, on how truly fortunate we all are to be members of an institution whose mission is so fundamentally and intrinsically good. Our university changes lives for the better, and each one of us, each one of us gets to play a role in that really good work. It doesn't get much better than that. And in the spirit of beneficence, with a sense of gratitude, take a few moments during the day to express your appreciation to your colleagues. Tell them that you are grateful for their support and for their encouragement. And then on Monday, when we all return to this beautiful campus, let's go to work. Let's continue to dedicate ourselves to the success of our students. That is our core mission. And let's continue to build the bright, bold future that is worthy of the women and the men who had the vision and the generosity to found our university nearly 100 years ago. Thank you all for joining us this morning. Have a good day and a great year. Thank you very much. Thank you, President Mearns. We can also take a moment to acknowledge our interpreters this morning. They've been Kristen Canney and Alan Hawker. Thank you very much. And we'd also like to thank our wonderful brass quartet, Andrew Hacker, Ben Maynard, Kiernan McNamara, and Sam Michaels. Thank you very much. I want to remind all award winners to please return to the stage for photos immediately following the convocation. I know you'll be off to college, department, and area meetings shortly, but I want to remind you that Fan Jam is scheduled tomorrow from 5 to 7 at Schumann Stadium, and faculty members are asked to join us for the freshman convocation Sunday afternoon. Lineup and academic regalia is at 1.30 p.m. in the lower lobby of Emmons, the Williams Lounge. This is a key academic affairs event of Welcome Week. We wish you the best for the new school year ahead. Let's welcome Kelsey back to the stage. Please stand and join us as she sings the alma mater.
We stand adjourned. Will the award winners please come back to the stage? Thank you. Enjoy the rest of your day.